want to welcome everybody to this episode of The American Idea. Today we're honored to be joined by Amity Schlaes, uh, author, best-selling author, and chairman and CEO of the Coolidge Foundation. Amity, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, the Coolidge Foundation, tell, me, tell us, tell me, tell our listeners a little bit about the Calvin Coolidge Foundation and what it does. President Calvin Coolidge, who, who served, just as a reminder, in the 20s, uh, was a wonderful president and very little known. And next year, 2023, is uh, yeah. the centennial of his presidency. So our job as a foundation is to make him better known, largely through young people, mm -hmm. trying to get young people maybe in high school and college to consider a president who actually cut the budget in peacetime hmm. and uh, who uh, was always polite and cut taxes too and respected federalism. He, you can sense he wanted to always say the United States in a plural, the United States are good uh -huh. because he wanted to emphasize the state. So he's a forgotten president. We tried to bring him alive and our, our main program is a scholarship in his name, a merit scholarship to college. Uh -huh. Fantastic. So how did you get interested in Calvin Coolidge? As you say, he's sort of a forgotten president by many at least. How does Amelie Schles get interested in him? Well, everyone makes investments even if we're not on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And a historian has to invest in a project that's worthwhile. So if, if President Coolidge were a stock share, a stock of a company, he'd be the most mispriced. That is, his public ranking is fairly low. He's sort of in the middle. Mm. Um, he's right. sometimes below the middle, say in the 20 to 30 range, often closer to the 30 when presidents are ranked. And the evidence suggests he should be number 10 among presidents or number wow. eight. Okay. So history got him wrong, and it's exciting work for a historian to try and demonstrate why there this gap, why there is this gap, why this gap yeah. exists. So uh, part of your work as a historian, of course, is the wonderful book that you wrote, the biography that you wrote of Calvin Coolidge. Um, what are the challenges of writing about Coolidge? And I'm thinking about, he, had, he was called in, in the 20s, Silent Cal. Uh, the challenges of capturing someone with that nickname. They are significant. There are two reasons a Coolidge bio, which I wrote, is hard. One is he was a president. Mm -hmm. A lot of other people have written about him. Even uh, Calvin Coolidge has plenty of biographies, so uh, including some very good ones by Sobel, I want to mention. Uh -huh. The Wall Street historian Sobel mm -hmm. is fantastic. So, uh, it, And if you get something wrong, someone will point it out mm -hmm. because people are fascinated with presidents. So it's a difficult genre, whoever, whichever president is your topic. But second, Coolidge himself resisted his biographers. He sabotaged really? them, basically. <laughs> That's a little unusual. He, <laughs> he sabotaged them because he didn't want, he was a, his name wasn't Calvin for nothing. He didn't want to demonstrate any vanity, betray any vanity. So he uh, scattered his papers around, destroyed some, mm. didn't endorse funding for a presidential library. That's okay with us because we think presidents, um, you know, uh, are, are better when they're independent from the current government. But the, the reality is he has no presidential library, and we at the Coolidge Foundation um, have to work mm -hmm. ourselves and find the resources. So as a biographer, in the same case, I had to scrounge around to find all the evidence one would need to put together a Coolidge biography. And I'm not sure he would have liked the intrusion, you know. <laughs> he, he was a very private man. Right. And he didn't like the vertical pronoun, everything about me, I. Mm -hmm. He liked service. But that's what makes him so charming. Tell us a little bit about what you discovered in writing this biography of Coolidge that maybe most surprised you about the man. Well, if, if you're interested in Edmund Burke, Coolidge had some Burkean aspects. That is, once in a while, he would vote against a proposition that his own community wanted. So say uh -huh. in Vermont, there was a flood. Naturally, his own community in an emergency, it was a terrible flood, the flood of 1927. That community might have said, well, we could do with some aid. Um, Coolidge didn't think it was right for the federal government to 
um, get into the aid business mm. on a huge scale, even when his own constituency needed aid. And nowadays, a politician will say, I got it, they're my people. Coolidge said, I'm not president of Vermont. I'm president of the entire country. And it's not in the interest of the entire country and the entire populace oh. to give, uh, to support spending for this class of people, Vermonters, even though I'm from Vermont. That's very different from politicians today. He, he didn't yeah. act like a congressman. He uh, acted more like a senator. That is, um, he was serving the republic as much as an individual state. And he was quite conscious of it. So one thinks of Burke's writing, and Burke, Burke, of course, in the UK, forwent a constituency because he didn't want to vote the way the people in the town, I believe it was Bristol, wanted him to vote on something. And he explained to them, I, I can't do it. I am looking at the aggregate because it's my current assignment being in Parliament. Right. Same thing. So that's very old and yet also I think very modern in that it's um, honest of Coolidge uh, mm -hmm. and I like that a lot. Um, in the 20s, how was Calvin Coolidge thought of? Uh, <clears throat> obviously he's the Republican Party, but there were different wings or parts of the Republican Party. And he assumes the presidency, of course, uh, at least originally, by not being elected, but succeeding to the presidency for, as from vice president. What did his fellow Republicans think of Calvin Coolidge? Well, there, as you point out, Jeff, there are many kinds of Republicans. And Coolidge was not a Theodore Roosevelt Republican, uh -huh. which was the issue then. Think of today, the Republican Party is divided. It has some pretty big characters. Uh, um, marching around, we can feel the rumbles in the, the in those days that character was Theodore Roosevelt uh -huh. who actually left the party to run for president. He was so unhappy that he wasn't running for president for the GOP and unhappy with the way the GOP, the Republican Party, his party formatted what its policy, that he went off and divided the whole election by creating the Bull Moose Party. Coolidge was a conservative Republican, a markets Republican most of the time a traditional Republican, not a progressive Republican. And many of, if you look at who is really nastiest about Coolidge, they are either, they're progressives, whether within the Republican mm, Party or okay. without. For example, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, the daughter of TR, who is a wit and actually friends with the Coolidge family, said he looks as though he's been weaned on a pickle <laughs> of Coolidge. What, what he looked like is a guy uh, who lived b uh, before the era of cosmetic dentistry that we have now. <laughs> you know, we, he, he, he hid his teeth because they, they weren't beautiful by the time he was in his 50s. Ah, I see. All right. But he didn't look as though he'd been weaned on a pickle. Or Dorothy Parker, the great wit of the New Yorker magazine, mm -hmm. said when he died, she said something cruel because of his stillness. She said, how could they tell? that Coolidge had died. Well, Dorothy Parker was probably not a traditional Republican. Right. <laughs> uh, so you have to discount that, or I think, um, anyway, there were the, the people who mocked Coolidge in the 20s were friends with the progressives and understood the progressives better. What we've forgotten is that many, many papers love Coolidge. It's not as now where the media are more on the progressive end of it. It was a real mixture, and there were so many newspapers. Mm. So Coolidge enjoyed quite a bit of support right. in uh, this day. It's just the support he got isn't read nowadays. One of the things that you've pointed out in your work on Coolidge, which I think might be surprising to some of our listeners, is his um, opinions about and record on civil rights. One has to always judge people in their era. Mm -hmm. And for his era, Coolidge was remarkably, um, I won't say forward-looking, because he would have said backward-looking. He thought um, that all Americans are equal um, under the Constitution, you know, he, or, or, and the Declaration. Mm -hmm. If all men are equal, that is final. And that it was our job, incrementally, to make reality correspond to our, the ideal to which we are nationally committed. I think only he differed on pace. He didn't feel the first fierce urgency of now on some legislation. One thing that Coolidge did do, though, while he was vice president, was support anti-lynching legislation, uh, which was not necessarily in keeping with federalism because it imposed 
um, police authority of some kind over the states, but Coolidge understood that lynching was so heinous and wrong, that murder is so heinous and wrong, that why not have anti-lynching legislation, which the Democratic Party at that time didn't support, and many Republicans didn't. That, mm. lin that legislation did not pass, but you can see if you study Coolidge, him uh, sort of watching it, supporting it in, in the Senate while he was vice president, and then again in his statements as president, he also um, was approached by some Republican or other who said, I don't think an African American should run for office as congressman um, during the 24 election, and Coolidge wrote back a public letter. That is, he outed the guy to humiliate him in modern really? terminology, hmm. which isn't like Coolidge because Coolidge it was polite. And he, Coolidge published this letter in public, or saw to it, where he said, I'm astonished, amazed to even get a letter from you. African Americans are citizens. They served in World War I just as everyone else did. They did not betray our country. Many of them sacrificed their lives. They are citizens. How dare you say they, they shouldn't be congressmen? Mm. Um, he also uh, got involved unusually for him because he didn't like government spending in, in support of an appropriation to build out uh, the medical school at Howard U, the historically black college in yeah. Washington. Mm -hmm. And that was unusual at the time, too. Certainly more outspoken and um, did more than, say, Woodrow Wilson. Today we think one thing of the Republican Party and another of the Democrats, these are just stereotypes. The mm. parties were different then, and the parties are different than the stereotype today, too, actually. Anyway, so, mm -hmm. so when you go back and look, I discovered, I'll just say one last thing for anyone who wants to pursue this, there was a young lady um, who, was his gra who was hanging around the house when the Coolidge's lived in Northampton, Mass. She attended Smith College. It was Eunice Carter. And she was the grandmother of a law professor, Stephen Carter, who teaches oh. at Yale now. And mm -hmm. he wrote a bio. And apparently the Coolidge's had Eunice over to use their law library in the house because mm. she was interested in the law as an undergraduate. And she even hosted Coolidge on the campus of Smith an uh -huh. African-American um, young lady. Uh, and I think that the connection with Eunice taught him a lot, particularly about the service of African-Americans in World War I. Eunice's mother, mm. Carter's mother, she was called Hunton before she married, uh, wrote a book about African-American service in World War I. But I, I haven't proven that. That's one of the things about oh, the historian's work. Really interesting. Uh, yeah. But anyway, he, he did a lot of things, not always publicly. Uh -huh. That's the other thing. He, he didn't feel the need to showboat his virtues. Right. Um, what president, if you could, or public figure, post Calvin Coolidge, maybe even post World War II, reminds you most of Calvin Coolidge, or has strains of Calvin Coolidge in him or her? Well, the obvious one is Ike. Mm. Um, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, because Eisenhower did operate behind the scenes, not because he was sneaky only, but because he believed in delegation. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's poor management if you want to control everything yourself and need to, right? right? You're an inadequate manager if you don't have people competent to do things in your department that need done. Coolidge really believed that his cabinet were delegated to, they must make the decisions of their cabinet. He didn't like them running to him for mm. every question just to seek his approval. And he tried to be so reliable they didn't feel the need to do that. Uh -huh. And Ike was the same way. Um, also, Ike controlled the budget as best he could in the Cold War. So if you go look, who didn't like and even prevented to some or more extent the budget expanding in his presidency, you have to compare Ike's data points to Coolidge's, they're pretty good. Interesting. We think Coolidge huh. has an even better record, but we're, we're talking, um, by the way, here only of peacetime, because yeah, then right, you get into right, war, and that's right. another kind of presidential spending. Uh, I think people think of Calvin Coolidge, if they know he was president in the 1920s, they think of the phrase, the Roaring Twenties. Do you think Coolidge deserves credit, or I guess blame, but probably credit is the right word, for the Roaring Twenties? I think he does. He definitely does. Harding does too. The two of them, the, this single document set that needs to be studied 
is the Republican Party plan of 1920. Not just the agenda, not just the platform, but everything, because that party had a choice. It could go progressive, it could go with a TR type, right? Mm -hmm. um, t those are two choices, or it could go traditional. And it went traditional, and not everyone agreed with that in the party. Mm -hmm. And then it spent a lot of energy writing plans. We're going to pass a new budget law. We're going to clarify and lower taxes. We're going to have normalcy, was what Harding called it, Warren Harding, the presidential candidate in 1920, common, a return to common sense. We're going to restore some assets the government holds to private hands. So that was a mighty set of documents. When you are going to wage war, it's good to have a plan. They had one. Mm. They prevailed over the progressives. It was quite difficult. Um, but. Harding and then Coolidge followed this plan. Indeed, Coolidge vowed to continue Harding's work after Harding sadly passed away to perfection. That was to continue to fulfill the assignment he got. It wasn't about him from the GOP documents from 1920. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today, we don't emphasize platforms. There scarcely is one. And, and that what the 20 shows is that might be a problem. Yeah. So, so that th those that's a good um, paper for someone to look at the GOP yeah, documents. The GOP wasn't a perfect. The conservative GOP party wasn't perfect by all of our lights. For example, it supported tariffs, um, mm. which were counterproductive and hurt Cuba. Um, mm. For example, right. but but by and large, they did what they said. And as Matt Denhart says in our Coolidge film, we have a new Coolidge film. Coolidge did what he said, and people like the results. Whether you don't, you know, people will like you if you bring good results, and then they'll go back and examine your means and say, can I live with those means, or would I have done it another way? Mm -hmm. But if they like the results and you do what you say all along, voters come to trust you, and Coolidge built up that trust. I think if if folks know anything else about Calvin Coolidge, certainly people who are historians of the 1920s or historians of America, they know he famously said that he, did, he would not choose or did not choose to run again in 1928, even though he was popular. Why did Calvin Coolidge not seek re-election? Because he cared more about the country than his own vanity. It was a big one. Really? He said, America is a republic. We need to, this isn't about the people. It's about the institutions, and it's good for the institutions to change leadership from time to time. He also said he didn't think the president had to be a great man. He said it's a mm. safety for the country uh, when, and, and a comfort for the president when he knows he's not a great man. He's just a servant. And that, th that met with incomprehension in, in that <laughs> period, too, because the Republicans thought, if he's popular, he has long coattails, we're going to win. And indeed, his successor, Herbert Hoover, ran on the idea that his would be a continuation of Coolidge policy. Uh -huh. And they're two fellows very different, yeah, Hoover and very much. Coolidge, but he had to promise that uh, to help himself uh, to victory. Uh -huh. So, so I, I admire Coolidge very much for that. Uh, it's, it's, one watches it as, I don't know, King George must have watched George Washington. He's going to do what? Right. He's not going to, um, but some, you know, sometimes you are a great man by foregoing greatness. Hmm. Interesting. Um, it, we always like on the American idea to ask our guests, because it's the Ashbrook Center, we care deeply about American history and principles, who their favorite person is in American history. But I'm going to have to have a, put a caveat, which is, I'm not going to let you say Calvin Coolidge. Who is your favorite person in American history besides Calvin Coolidge? I'll have to say Andrew Mellon, who was his Treasury Secretary. Okay. And, and he's my favorite, perhaps not absolutely, but relative to others' favorites. That is, I feel, again, he's deeply underrated. Uh -huh. he, the evidence suggests he's deeply underrated. He wrote the reform that led to prosperity in the Roaring Twenties, and they really did roar. And he was persecuted, uh, that's not too strong a verb, prosecuted and persecuted in the Thirties as a cartoon of a rich man in the period of President Roosevelt. And rather than curl up in a ball, uh, mm. he outclassed the administration by giving the greatest gift a man can give. He gave us the National Gallery of Art. In the same period, the government was making his life 
rather difficult. Uh, his final years were spent in court defending his le largely legal behavior mm -hmm. um, against politicized opponents, and yet he gave the great gift of the na National Gallery at the same time. Fascinating. So w what a class act. Fascinating. Uh, Andrew Mellon. And not surprisingly connected to another class act, Calvin Coolidge. Yes. Thank you very much, Amity, for taking the time to be with us today and give us some insight into this fascinating, as you said, misunderstood and uh, underappreciated President Calvin Coolidge. Thank you. Thanks.